I can say humble servant of God working in electrical engineering for those of you who don't know me maybe from some other units and today I am sharing uh, the result of some research work that I have done on with my group on two-way wireless so with this if you don't mind I sit because I think I can write on the screen of this computer and that will be probably helpful so I, you know, as uh, you see here, I received my undergraduate and master's degree from Tehran University in Iran and PhD degree from McGill University in Canada. And I work in electrical and computer engineering department. So to start with, let's just go through an outline that I have. I start with an introduction, including some uh, review of who else has done what in this area, because this is a topic that uh, by no means is not new. People have been working on it since the 90s. And uh, I will try to explain within the time limitations the difference that essentially make the system much more robust and essentially practically functional and usable uh, compared to the previous works. Then I go to a lot of applications for two-way connection because this is a new area and has not been there. So people have not thought too much that what they could do with two-way wireless. What, one thing, message that's very important is that two-way wireless is not two-way communication over a wi wire or over a fiber. Because of the nature of wireless that we have broadcast, everybody hears everybody else, with two-way in wireless, we can do things that are very different and way more powerful. So I will go through some of this application, particularly the application in networking. So essentially, a network is a group of people. You can imagine in a room, in around the table, talking to each other. And just imagine if uh, instead of the five senses, they tell them, you, I can either talk or listen at a time. And you can make that decision. And just imagine what a chaos will be that discussion. Because when the person starts talking, doesn't hear others. And you know it will be just a whole mess. And uh, two-way enables us to solve this issue. Because when we are talking to another person in two directions, we can also listen to messages that are sent to us indicating that they would like to connect with this unit. Then I talk about a new way of doing communication altogether, what I call media-based. And it's essentially based on embedding the information that we want to transmit instead of in the source, which is a traditional method, and suffer a lot because of linearity and time invariance, we embed it in the channel. And I tell you how. And this result in a system that is linear by time varying. So essentially, all the previous knowledge, more, most of the previous knowledge in the area of wireless or communication in general breaks down. It's not applicable anymore. And we see that we can, gains, we can achieve gains that are way beyond uh, for example, a MIMO system by a simpler structure. And I talk about security application because wireless by default is assumed to be insecure because everybody hears everybody else. But the same feature can contribute to its security because if we do it right, if we talk to each other at the same time, third party will hear the uh, speech or the data from both of us and that makes it harder. From information theory perspective, that's like a multiple access channel for the eavesdropper. And more importantly, what we can do, which is I introduced in this presentation, we can have a closed loop between the two parties. In communication phase is always a relative, relative to a preamble. But if you have a closed loop, you can have a reference of phase that is not relative anymore. We, you and me, we have this closed loop. We have an actual reference of phase that is shared between us, and we can use that as a key. That's what I will discuss. And finally, I come to some uh, conclusions and acknowledgments. 
And I, here in this presentation, I focus only on main points. If you are interested, more is, can be found on this, this website. Now, objective is that I have an access point and multiple clients. I want to connect this access point to the clients using, let's say, OFDMA for multiplexing of users. But over each tone of OFDM, we want to have two-way communication. Each of these links will have two-way communication. This link has two-way communication. Oops, sorry. This link has two-way communication, and so on. Tones are distributed among the clients. We want to have support multiple antenna system over each tone. Do not want to sacrifice that additional flexibility we can get through space multiplex, spa you know, special degrees of freedom. And also, we want to have the clients do not need to be synchronized because synchronization is a critical part in enabling us to cancel the interference that the unit causes to itself from the transmitter to the receiver in the same unit. But we want the client to be able just, you know, enters a zone, wants to get connected, just start shooting the beacon or whatever that can get that uh, unit connected to the network. So this will be just totally uh, transparent to the operation of the rest, doesn't need to coordinate with anybody. This solves a lot of networking issues. And also, clients do not need to have full duplex connectivity. As long as the access point has that capability, can still manage, send to one, receive from one. Of course, over OFDMA. OK. History of this work, I have been working on this since 2006, 2005. And we had the basic hardware Functional in 2009, the engineer Rafael Hernandez who worked on this is here. But essentially I kept it quiet because I wanted to make it more mature because I realized that previous works reported in 1990s, although they established the connection, they were forgotten because it's not about establishing the connection. It's about establishing a two-way connection such that it's robust, it works under all conditions, and so on. Also, I wanted to have some uh, intellectual property protection. And why I'm doing it now? Because I think it's uh, mature now. Now, as I said, a lot of people have worked on this topic. In particular, in recent years, 2011, 2010, 2011 time frame, there were papers by, say, by um, Microsoft, by Rice University, by uh, the team of researchers from Stanford University. And they have also video clips on the web. And I will try to give you a very quick description of what's the difference of what I'm explaining here with respect to what uh, has been there in general. These are some more references. And by no means it's not, uh, the references are not limited to the list I have here. I have gone through more than 300 references of patents and articles. And what I'm presenting today is new, and I will tell you why it works on, under all conditions, all operating environments, and very stable, unlike all the previously reported uh, implementation. So in particular, there has been a uh, news release from Stanford University in 2010. And also, they had two papers, one in 2010, one in 2011. And they reported an antenna structure that is the first page of a patent that I applied in 2006 and was issued in 2010. So that's also, you know, um, essentially. But what I'm presenting today, just want to make it clear, that's very different from that initial ideas that I had in 2005, 2006, when I applied for that patent. Anyways, what they do is that they had, uh, essentially what I was also thinking at that time, to transmit antenna, creating a null at the position of a receive antenna. And this requires too many antennas, has bandwidth limitation, and so on. And I will discuss how we solve those issues. So this is from my patent. And they have something exactly similar if you go to their uh, news release. So what is new and why it works? First, antennas are designed to reduce coupling at the RF, meaning I have a transmit unit, a receive unit. We'll, I will discuss antenna structures that theoretically result in zero coupling. 
But in practice, such a thing doesn't exist, because of, mainly because of reflections from the surrounding environment. I have a video clip on that website, shows that the coupling can be minus 70 dB on a net network analyzer. But when you just move the antenna for one centimeter, it drops down to minus 35. So, but antennas plays a big role, because right away you get at least 35, 40 dB isolation. Then we have active cancellation prior to A2D. Active cancellation is an area that has been used in, fair to say, a few hundred different places. But the difference that this one has, essentially what it means, it means that you make from your digital data an analog signal that will cancel your analog signal coming from your transmitter leakage in the analog domain prior to A2D. How you do it is one issue. But more importantly, what makes the system work is that regardless of you know, the accuracy that you can have in that cancellation, as long as you keep the path for the cancellation linear, it doesn't matter how precise it is. It reduces the coupling by another 40 dB, but it's still too much. But as long as it is linear and has error, you can measure that error in the baseband of an equivalent system and then do digital subtraction because we know what data we are transmitting. So this is a critical part. And another part is that digital cancellation also now here works very well because we have kept the system linear. And in some of the papers works reported earlier, um, essentially, they, they have not been able to use these two, digital and analog, together. So they, you know, sometimes they, even having a digital cancellation works to their disadvantage. So they have a decision, apply digital or not. But here, digital always works because of that linearity issue. Because D2A is linear, that's the key point. And as long as you keep the rest linear, that will make you a linear system. But A2D is nonlinear, it doesn't matter. I'm just canceling things prior to A2D. So this is that basic structure. We have a transmit and a receive chain. So what I have is, sorry. What I have, I have one main transmit chain that goes through this power amplifier. Then I have additional transmit chain. Doesn't need to have a power amplifier, can just, what this additional one does, it's supposed to subtract and cancel the self-interference in the analog domain prior to A2D. It can be have an another antenna for transmit, it can be just coupled as an I and Q mixer. It's somehow, essentially, this signal from this TX unit to this Rx that comes through this path, I have another copy that is subtracted here. And I may build that copy in the OFDM domain tone by tone. It's very precise. And don't forget, when I am doing this, I have a big advantage that I am using my own clock, I am using my own carrier, so everything works as if it's on, you know, in a textbook. Okay? So it's, it's not, there is no compromise in ability to build that signal. The only problem is that in order to do this, as I said, I am supposed to cancel. There is an H1 leakage over one of the OFTM tones from this guy, which is either there is two path, there is through this path, or over a transmit antenna, and this is the main path. If I measure these two separately, I measure an H1 and H2. Now, what I do, I put minus H2 here, and plus H1 here. So then these two paths are supposed to cancel each other because H1 times H2 minus H1 times H2, they subtract. And in the analog, so before this A to D, I am supposed to get these two signals pretty much canceling each other. But the problem is that I am never able to measure this H1 and H2 precisely because values are way bigger than what I can handle. But the point is, it doesn't matter if I have errors. I keep those error fix. And then I put these filters here. And then I send a signal through two of this and measure. I have already measured this. And then I sub do the subtraction here. 
So bottom line, regardless of what delta H1 and delta H2 are, I, by sending pilots from this path that goes through both of them, I am able to measure this channel precisely because the whole system is linear. So then I know what I'm transmitting. I multiply it by that equivalent linear coefficient. I subtract. So that makes it work very well. Now, here is the detail of derivation. If you are interested on that website, goes in through everything. It just essentially says you, errors that you have in measuring the first channel, error in the pilot, error in the second channel, error in the pilot. Then, when you have the here, I get a term that is very small because it involves the product of the two errors. And this is the channel that I can measure at the end of the day. And because that channel essentially is linear, I can uh, do that subsequent stage of cancellation. And that subsequent stage of cancellation is you know, here I am sending this OFTM frame. It has its own error. And if you go through these derivations, basic linear system, I get this term that I am essentially pretty much like equalization. I'm subtracting later on. And this is a term that is in the digital domain, and I know what it is. Because this delta, gamma, this comes from the rounding effects in IFFT and so on and so forth. And I know what this term is. And if I need, I can just add it digitally later on. So now, with this, Introduction, I now here I have a more uh, detailed comparison with uh, Rice and Stanford University's designs. Essentially in 2010, 2011, after we had even the hardware functional. But um, both of these are tested under restricted environments, meaning that if you go to that website, you see that we test the system by putting a metallic rate right in front of it. It's a video clip on the website that I have mentioned. So, and the system that I, I am proposing works under all condition, has a much better performance in signal to noise ratio, has a smaller size, essentially no increase in complexity, and it doesn't have bandwidth limitation because this subtraction, you have to be careful that it has to be flat over the entire frequency band. So the, in terms of antenna design, the right team do not get into the antenna design part. And the Stanford team, team have essentially come to the antennas that I had initially patented in 2006. In terms of analog and digital cancellation, main difference is that, uh, you know, essentially the main difference is that that combination of signal reconstruction, linearity, D2A is linear, A2A is nonlinear, it's not noticed in the world. So, the combination of that fact and the fact that we have antenna structure with very low coupling, uh, coupling make the system work much better. So now let's get into the meat of the presentation. So I have discussed, so we saw that if we have leakage signal from transmit to receive, I am able by maintaining linearity to do at two levels, one analog, one digital, essentially cancel them. A subtraction in the analog domain prior to A to D and a subtraction in the digital domain afterwards. But how do we design the antennas? So the first thing that we notice is that you know, near field is a very interesting phenomenon in the sense that it's very powerful, but at the same time, it's not random. It doesn't have reflection from any environment or anything. So it's very much predictable. And once you, you know, see how, what Maxwell equations tell you, um, essentially you have the solution. There is no weird behavior of randomness. Maxwell equation tells us that you have, uh, they are linear in, and they have geometrical symmetry, meaning that if I go from one point to the space under some symmetry to another point, I get um, essentially certain symmetry in the field. Now. We use this symmetry in the wave for the purpose of cancellation. So the first is what I have called pairwise symmetrical antennas. Please just pay attention that 
I am discussing this, focusing on having a separate transmit and a separate receive antenna. In my opinion, it doesn't matter because it's not restrictions in my mode that when you have two antennas, they have to be far away. Here, they can be very close to each other. But later on, I will present a design, and it's on the video clip, it's on the web, that you have a single antenna for both transmit, receive, and that combining thing. Okay? So this is just an example of uh, symmetry. So we call two antennas pairwise symmetrical if the two arms are image of each other for each of the antenna with respect to a plane of symmetry in terms of both the structure and the excitation. And the two antennas are also mutually symmetrical, meaning that have in their se they have separate planes of symmetry, and one is the has symmetry with respect to the plane of the other one. Example is here. This black antenna, this one, this red one, is symmetrical with this black one. These two red points are symmetrical with this black one. This one never works because the you know connections are far away. But and, um, and in terms of theory, they have they satisfy this condition. Here I have in three dimension, this is pairwise symmetrical with this. Again in three dimension, another situation. Now, I have here a very uh, rough proof, a more detailed based on pointings theory is on the web, that if you have such two pairwise symmetrical antennas, the current that goes through one apply, uh, creates a Vol creates a voltage or field or whatever you call it in this arm and does the same in this other arm. So they cancel each other. So the coupling between these two over the entire range of frequency range is zero. In theory, they shouldn't have any coupling if we had this uh, ideal construction. Here are the results of some simulations with HFSS that uh, Dr. Achia, he's a postdoctoral fellow working with me, he did this. He simulated exact same shapes. So when you have this red and black antennas, the coupling is minus 90 dB, according to HFSS. I make the, get this one is minus 90 dB. This minus 90 dB is probably the error limitation of HFSS. It's a numerical uh, software tool for uh, antenna test. But if I turn one of them, the coupling comes to minus 2 dB. So I just want to show you how powerful the uh, near field is. So it's very critical that we have this first stage of essentially when we shout, we don't hear. That's, that's critical, which has not been in the previous works. Now, I can have antennas that are triple-wise symmetrical when I go to three dimensions. These three antennas are pairwise symmetrical. Each of two, each two of them are pairwise symmetrical. And the coupling between them is an S matrix that is diagonal. So all non-diagonal elements are zero. And I can extend this construction to MIMO, meaning that all these red antennas are pairwise symmetrical with blue antennas. So I can use the blue antennas for transmit, the red ones for receive. And the nice thing is that there is no such thing as 2D or 3D. In reality, we have something that I think in RF they call it 2.5D, meaning that you are working on the two sides of a PCB. And when you work on the two sides of a PCB, you can construct structures based on patch antennas that satisfy the condition for symmetry the same as we can get in three dimension. Because don't forget, in two dimension, if you want to get pairwise symmetry, fine, we can do it. It's hard, but we cannot extend it to MIMO. I am actually in that presentation on the web, you know, I discussed a few ways of extending it to MIMO based on some other properties. But by relying on patch structures, you have essentially three dimension on a PCB, so you can do it. This is, for example, um, uh, blue and red antennas are pairwise symmetrical. This is the red as a patch, this is the blue. And this is the antenna that, again, I um, have the video clip of performance on the web. It's a patch structure that combines transmit, receive, and that auxiliary transmitter, which is for the purpose of uh, cancel, interference cancellation. Something like this would work. Something like this would work. And this is easy to extend to MIMO while satisfying the condition for symmetry and having zero coupling. Although that zero coupling is just something that is of theoretical interest, 
In practice, we get minus 30, minus 40 dB, and some other constructions that I have on the website that I mentioned also enable you to build MIMO structures that have small enough coupling. Now, let me give you an example of performance that uh, uh, Rafael Hernandez, who is an engineer working with me, and he's here right, away, right now. So if we rely only based on the antenna, so what we did, we said, okay, so let's just get the noise level, meaning that your antenna receiver is not that getting anything. There's nothing sent over the air. Let's measure the noise. And now let's see how much degradation I have on top of the noise. One thing that I have to explain if that, if you do the same experiment and the node A is sending to node B, you get a huge increase in the noise level because node A is using a carrier that is different from node B, using a clock that is different, a lot of differences. So what I'm reporting here is a situation that is really with respect to the noise level. So this is not a fair comparison in the sense that we should compare it with the system saying that how much you get degradation when you are doing traditional way of sending A to B. Anyway, so what happens is that if you rely only on the antenna structure, you have 40 dB increase in the noise level, which is not much because the noise is very low, but it's still 40 dB, your signal will be lost. To give you an idea, signal to noise ratio typically is around 20 dB in a lot of applications. If you work on the analog cancellation, you get 2 dB cancellation. And then after we do digital active cancellation, we get 0.4 dB. And again, I repeat this form, 0.4 dB. If you measure the system sending from A to B, it's probably 2, 3 dB. OK, so now I come to network application. So you know, let's see how we can use this two-way to have um, Facilitate network. So to put my <coughs> this, to put the discussion in perspective, here I have some example of actual WLAN network that exists on UW campus. We have a total of about 1,400 wireless access point and across campus, serving about 4,200 wireless IP. And in theory, each of these access points should support at least 40, 54 megabit per second, which is old system. Newer systems are supposed to do a few hundred megabit per second. Now, what happens is that, let me first tell you, the entire campus, wireless and wire, the traffic going out of campus is a wireless, it's an optical link with capacity of one gigabit per second and barely goes above one third of its capacity. And similarly, what comes back is one gig. So the entire campus traffic is on the average about a few hundred megabits per second. But what happens is that when they see that an access point has typically more than 10 users, they install another access point because the quality of service becomes terrible. So here I have an example of the entire campus. This is time of the day. At its peak, we have 1,800 users accessing the internet wirelessly. And the bit rate for all of them together is 150 megabit per second, two-way, back and forth. It's, it's trivial. And here is you know, the wireless traffic over the entire campus, but uh, different time scale. Now let's look at the DC library. This one of the access points in the DC library at time, let's say, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, probably has been an exam time or something. We have 24, at speak, we have 24 users accessing the network. And at this peak, if you look at this rate, the access point is supporting in total, at its peak, about 3 megabit per second for all of these users. And these users have a terrible service. Delay, a lot of things goes wrong. So the reason is, essentially, this access point is supporting 6% of its peak. The problem is not with the backbone network, because you know, those are usually one third of their capacity. The problem, the problem is in the way that they access, they get connected. And this is because of that example of sitting around the table that everybody who wants to talk has, you know, essentially, we're just either disturbing each other, somebody else may start talking in the middle of somebody else's discussion, disturb the whole thing, it's a mess that most of you know. So how do we solve this problem? First of all, in order to solve this problem, we need to have a way 
of detecting new users in an asynchronous manner. And this block diagram, which is composed of an, ad an additional stage of cancellation in the time domain, does that job. And the details of this, please go to this website. The, you know, it, it all relies on the property of the sequences, periodic sequences that wireless units send at the beginning to establish a link. And that baseband, which is baseband cancellation, which is asynchronous with the other node, but synchronous with the data of its the node that is listening, enables to detect that somebody wants to connect to you. And then I have you know, something I'm not sure if how new it is, but I, I have not heard about this, a concept that they call it superimposed networking, meaning that we have our two-way connections as the main data sending data between the users, and superimposed on top of it, we have a network of carrier sense, can be carrier sense, can be very simplistic, asynchronous with the main network that is for data, and this is for the people to join the network, because the problem arises when people want to join the network. Or the problem arises when the access point has to do the resource allocation. So this additional stage is low spectral efficiency, doesn't matter, spectral efficiency is not an issue, and can have very simple structure, but essentially works asynchronous with the first layer and right on top of it just for control signaling. And again, need more details of this are available on that website. You can even do the following, like there is a basic structure in uh, information theory called interference channel, and it has been subject of a huge amount of research, so it's known that the best you can do for this system, essentially in this node, TX1 is sending to RX1, TX2 is sending to RX2. The best you can do is to give half of the bandwidth to one of them, or half of the time to one of them, half of the time to the other one, in terms of the situation, in many situations, like at high SNR and so on. But if this guy has two-way capability, all this linear system, including whatever is remaining of the leakage of the node between itself, this guy can have a receipt filter that receives the information from this, superimposed over this, such that they cancel each other at this point. So you get a multiplexing gain of one, because interference is essentially canceled. It causes you some degradation in signal-to-noise ratio, but you know, multiplexing, so-called multiplexing gain doesn't uh, consider that, doesn't account for that. And the reason that you can do this, you see, in information theory, the assumption it always is that delay is the delay of other, a code symbol or a code block. We have a discrete time model, you send a symbol, and it has one unit of delay. You cannot ever receive it with less than one unit delay. But the reality of transmission is that the delay, minimum delay that you require is the delay dictated by the channel memory. And this is already captured in the OFDM secret prefix. And when it comes to actual code symbols, you are, they are OFDM symbols. And OFDM symbols, there is no such thing as the need to wait for a delay of one symbol. Any delay within cyclic prefix results in a phase. So the system works. OK, so I have several mode cases for network application, for example, in you know, so-called in network information theory broadcast systems, for example, require uh, channel state information at the transmitter, he, which is a main bottleneck. Here we have that backward link always there, so they know what the state is. In the uplink, in the downlink, in you know, a few different configurations I have described on the bigger, larger presentation, more detailed presentation on the web that uh, if you are interested, you can look at. Now, I talk about next about a new way of doing wireless communication, which is based on what I would call media-based. You put the information in the channel instead of putting it in the source. When you put it in the source, you have a linear time invariant system. If you, put one, if you have one transmit antenna and you have 10 receive antenna, those 10 receive antenna span a one-dimensional space. When they span a one-dimensional space, you, all you can do is to do maximum ratio combining to get some saving in energy. 
What I am suggesting is that instead of putting the information in the source, we put the main part of the information in the channel. How we do it, I describe. And also, we can also put some in the source. And then what happens is that magic happens. Essentially, your receive antennas will act like sampling over space, independent observation over space, which gives you addition of information follows, information add together, and energy is as if I have spent one unit of energy, I have received K, if I have K, I receive antennas. Of course, these energies are all after you know, accounting for, you know what I'm saying, like we account for the shadowing effect and you know, until we reach to multi-path effect. And as far as the multi-path is concerned, each receive antenna receive an independent uh, gate. Okay, so a lot of people ask me what's the you know, relevance of this to two-way. Um, one answer could be not much, but because I had it, I said let's just do all at once. And the reality is that if you have two-way, you can make this much simpler in terms of synchronization, in terms of a lot of things that now I am changing the channel. You know, if I send the pilot, the channel is changed. Next time that that pilot will not be useful. But if I have a reverse link, I am always updated. So that's the relevance. Now, the concept is simple. Look at this rabbit. It has a candle. And the rabbit is making the signs and communicating, sending the number five. The point is that this has a like an exponential effect, meaning that if you have two mirrors, you put something between them, you don't get two images, you get four images. If you adjust the angle properly, you get more. Okay? So depending on the angle, you can have like a situation like this. So the requirement of exponential increase with the number of possibilities which is what we need in communication, is there. And um, also, when we have a rich scattering environment, when you change the channel slightly, you get an independent observation. Independent channel, because it will just get amplified in terms of, it's like a chaotic system. It's in one stable state, state and when you change it, trigger it a little bit, it just gets out of that state, falls into another totally independent state. And what I'm saying about the state, this is the state of the channel. We don't care that much about magnitude. This, what we matters to us is the phase, and the phase is very easy to change. Okay, now this is just an example of how we can do it. I have the single transmit antenna, I am putting around it walls. Okay, these walls can just be stick to the antenna. And each of these walls independently add, change one of these parameters of our RF signal, mu, epsilon, sigma. Okay, and there are, like, have been a lot of applications for this, changing the epsilon, changing the mu, you know, speed of light, conductivity of RF media, like environment that their RF property can be changed by some absorption of some form of energy can be done, can be done very fast, and it's fairly easy. Now, if I change one of these surfaces by slightest amount in terms of phase, you know, let's imagine I change the speed of light propagating through this surface, and I keep it the same through all the surface. So the part of the wave that coming out of this will have a different phase. So when it gets reflected from the environment, you get totally a different phase for the whole thing. Now, this is essentially an analysis comparing the system. Now we are using one transmit antenna and K receive antenna. And we are changing the channel. We are keeping the source fixed. When you change the channel, your K antenna at the receiver side have the same effect of independent sampling over space instead of time. Okay? When you do it over time, you cannot you know, you have a sync function, you cannot sampling more than in the middle because you lose bandwidth efficiency. But here, when I have four antennas, I am observing with each of them gives us. And the, what they give us, they give you, <coughs> is independent of each other and depends on the propagation path, the gain of the channel from the transmit antenna to that specific receive antenna. And when I perturb the system, perturb the channel by changing the area around the transmit antenna, I am changing all of them. Okay, so MIMO systems, when you have N transmit antenna and K receive antenna, 
you get here a scale factor which is the minimum of n and k. This is very problematic because if you want to get the increase in the spectral efficiency, it's by the larger of the two. So essentially you have to use, let's say, four transmit antenna, four receive antenna. No way other than that. And approximately signal to noise ratio is you receive one unit of energy. That's not exactly true because you can do water filling over eigenvalues and that gives you a small amount of extra gain that I will discuss, but this is roughly the case. In this case, each receive antenna, media base, when you have one times k, each receive antenna gives you independent information. So you get a factor of k here right away, starting from the beginning. And I will tell you what the importance of this is, the beginning of the signal to noise ratio. And also, instead of one unit of energy, I am getting k unit of energy. So here, the total energy that I am observing Sorry, this should be probably just k, not k plus 1. So anyway, so each receive antenna is giving me an independent unit of energy. OK? No, no, no. This is k plus, uh, yeah, it, this should be probably only k. So it's type. So here I have the curves for a MIMO system. This is the legacy SISO, old-fashioned, you know, basic point-to-point -point digital system when you have a rate which is the log of 1 plus SNR. Energy is normalized to 1, bandwidth is normalized to 1. So you have a slope of 1 all the way. Of course, this curve has a logarithmic um, you know, behavior, but if you look at the slope versus SNR, it's always 1 with some shift in the dB. When you go for a MIMO with water filling, which is, there are several notions of capacity for MIMO system, but the one which is based on water filling gives you the largest amount of capacity. And this is based on the knowledge of channel state at the transmitter and expanding the channel over eigenvectors and so on and so forth. This, at the beginning, it does the energy allocation to the channel with the largest eigenvalue because the amount of energy is not enough to fill the rest. So the slope here will be expected value of sigma 1. And theoretically, if you get this is the largest eigenvalue of a Wieschert matrix. Theoretically, the limit of this is 4. If you increase the number of antenna to infinity, this reaches to 4. Anyways, up to certain range, which is determined by this, okay? Uh, these are eigenvalues of the Wieschert matrix, sigma 1, sigma 2, so on. These are eigenvalues of k by k Wieschert matrix. Up to a certain point, the channel is one-dimensional. Then it becomes two-dimensional with a slope of sigma 1 plus sigma 2, which is the sum of the first two eigenvalues, largest eigenvalue. Then it becomes three-dimensional. And eventually, it becomes k-dimensional. This is where the MIMO systems are famous for, that they achieve a slope of k. But this system that I'm discussing right away from the beginning gives you k. Okay? And that's very important because in the sense that it gives you saving in energy in high signal to noise ratio that I will show. Also, MIMO is always considered as a solution for high bit rates. A lot of applications, we don't want to send high bit rates, like optical transmission. Like there are wireless situations that I just want to send, you know, a very small number of bits, but at extremely low energy. MIMO won't work there because you are operating at this situation. So this system right away starts from that optimum slope and consequently, consequently, sorry about this computer wants to get connected. Okay, so now let's look at uh, three measures of performance. I do the comparison. The slope of rate versus SNR the in dB at SNR of equal to zero. Slope of SISO is one. Legacy k by k is the maximum eigenvalue of a k by k Wieschert matrix, which is theoretically shown that is limited by 4. So at most, you get a factor 4. You are sending over one channel, but because of the eigenvalue, the boost in energy that you get, you have a factor at most 4. And the 1 by k media system gives you k right away, and you can never get more than k. So if you look at the k by k MIMO, this is for two antennas, four antennas, eight antennas, and then eventually for infinity. So you see, even getting close to four, uh, we are pretty much, we have to increase the number of antennas a lot. And here we are just getting right away two, four, eight. Now here I have highest NR comparison in terms of 
signal to noise ratio. So this is the SNR in dB. This is for two antennas. This is for four antennas. I am limiting my rate to four bits per receive antenna, per hertz per second. This is typical, meaning that effective, effectively I am sending four bits. So if you go for higher, the gains will be more pronounced. But just for this, which is a typical scenario, you see that for a 2 by 2 MIMO, we have 6 dB gain at this situation. Uh, gain versus SISO of a 2 by 2 MIMO, which is this red curve, is 13 dB. And the gain of 1 by 2 media base is 19 dB. So as I increase the number of antennas or increase the rate, the gain increases. OK? So, and also, MIMO works, as I said, only for low, high SNR values. But in some application, for example, optical transmission or very low power wireless, it's important to use this additional degrees of freedom offered by the space to reduce the transmit energy. And this, this media base can do it. Here I have a comparison for eight antennas. So again, the rate is 32, which is four times eight. And again, I have already mentioned this at low SNR, unlike MIMO, media base has optimum slope of K. At high SNR, energy saving is, can be quite significant. Now, I have to make some remarks here. You have every right to say, OK, so you have a time-varying system, linear time-varying system. A time-varying system expands the spectrum, can expand the spectrum. If you switch it, it's like a modulator and so on. But it can be shown, it's fairly easy to show, that the power spectrum will be the average power spectrum, meaning add them together, divide by their number. All of the chan different channel realization times the power spectrum the of the input. And as long as you shape the power spectrum of the input, your power spectrum will be shaped. Don't forget, in a legacy systems also, there is no such thing as a signal that is both band limited and time limited. We have always approximation for you know, either limiting time or limiting frequency and having some degradation from the um, theory. So this is also a similar type of uh, limitation, and it, can, it depends on the input power spectrum. The equalization also, you know, you receive some number of pulses through time. They are independent of each other. And each of them are is independent, providing independent information. A lot of work needs to be done further on this, and I am working, continuing with my group working. So we can also even go back and change SISO system. So if I change the SISO system and I shoot a fire, a pulse of duration t, that is the, my time, uh, signaling interval, and I change the channel. What happens is that the effect of this change in the channel, because of impulse response of the channel is of length L, will be sensed, will affect L subsequent received signal. So if I upsample that signal, upsampling under ordinary circumstances just gives you a linear space. So you don't get anything more. But here, those samples gives us independent information. So it is, in some sense, saying that we have managed to have L reflections from the environment for our channel impulse response. And we are sending independent information over each of them. So essentially, it has also application in size. Now, with this, more discussion on this. Uh, same as before, you can please go to this website. Now it comes to security application. One observation I don't, I have, I'm not, I have not seen any, anywhere else that it has been discussed. The so-called one-time pad. It's very interesting. There is a paper on IEEE Explore, published in 1919 uh, by a person who is uh, a co-author with an officer from US uh, Navy or something. And they came with the first truly secure system based on using a secret key once and for never again. And they have a paper that explains that. So the concept is that, and now it's very well established, that you have a signal X, you modulo to add it with a mask that is your key, and you never use this key again. So if I do this modulo to addition, X and Y and Z will be, uh, two, each pair of them will be independent of each other if you don't know the other one. So if, essentially, if we don't know what Z is, X and Y provide zero information about each other. Now, what we can do, we can do this instead of 
over a binary, we can do it over phase, modulo m of phase additions, or generally of phase addition. Phase addition has this modulo 2 pi operation built in. And where does this phase come from? This is by nature. When we transmit, the channel has a phase that when I'm sending to you, the signal goes through a phase that is added to the phase of my transmit signal. And it's important that this phase, when it's added to the phase of my transmit signal, gives you, similar to this situation, a signal that in terms of phase is independent of x unless we know z. Now, don't forget, the phase in the channel between you and me depends on environment between us. Depends on every small reflection from a small object changes that phase. So if I manage to measure this, and you measure the same thing, we can use it as a key. It may not be perfect, but doesn't matter. In ordinary communication, we have always phase error. After phase synchronization, we have always some degradation. Channel codings are made to take care of that. Now the question is, how can I get a measure of phase between you and me without disclosing any information about that phase to a third party and having something that is absolute phase, not relative to some preamble. And two-way provides the way of doing this because we have a closed loop that is between you and me. We can use that closed loop in two ways that I described to establish a common phase. And then what do we do next? We don't, you know, it's not enough to have one phase. We can change the channel, as I mentioned in media base. In media base, we change it. Uh, essentially, you know, we need to change it among k possibilities or two to the power of r possibilities. Here, all what we need is to change it randomly, give another phase, and it's easy to change the phase. You see, that's the point. It's not. It's hard to change the magnitude, but it's very, very easy to change the phase. So, I have already mentioned this. And the key point is, in order to avoid leakage of information, each transmit antenna should be used only once. Under this condition, it replaces the condition that Veronum cipher, which I mentioned before, the Veronum is the person who came up with that idea of one-time pad in the First World War was used. Uh, the counterpart here is that you have to use each transmit antenna only once. Because if I use the transmit antenna twice, eavesdropper, get two observations, and they will go through all through a common channel to eavesdropper. So eavesdropper can get something useful out of it. Here is one construction that I don't go through it, but I explain the other one better. The point is that regardless of how many antennas Eve has, each antenna of Eve will add an unknown and will extract an equation. That equation can be never provide any useful information because it's the sum of a phase plus this unknown, which is another phase. And as long as this antenna is used only once, you are good. The second one is based essentially on this closed loop. So we have already you know, established this closed loop between two parties in the lab. And this can be, you know, it's essentially like a feedback system, like a control system with feedback that you can make it stable and measure a reference, a phase of this loop that both parties can measure it. And again, regardless of how many antennas Eve has, what the signal to noise ratio of those antennas are, even if they are infinite precision in terms of noise, each antenna has its own random phase and receives one equation and has one unknown, doesn't get anything. So, uh, this is essentially, I have a lot more discussion on uh, uh, another aspect of the using two-way to enhance information theoretical security or to just simply add confusion. Because now two parties can talk and one can cause, make it harder for the eavesdropper to hear what the other one is saying. You can see those at the website. So with this, I come to the end of my presentation. I am very grateful to my team, Rafa and Hernandez, who is the engineer who essentially implemented this from scratch, uh, based on some setup that um, some other engineers implemented, 82.11, on a hardware setup that we have from a Canadian company called Leartech. And Rafael implemented all of this. 
uh, algorithms for this. Mohsen Baratran is also here. He's another research engineer who has been essentially responsible for a lot of good things that happens in our lab. You know, every PCB, every test, without him, nothing works. And Hussein Akhia is a great postdoctoral fellow who has joined my group. These other two uh, gentlemen have been with me for several years, for, for three, four, five years. And Hussein joined last year. He has done a lot of HFS simulation. And I am very truly grateful for uh, funding I have received from Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation, uh, from NSERC, and uh, from uh, Canada Researcher. And also in terms of equipment, I have, um, you know, have had very fast sophisticated equipment that without their support would never be possible. I also am very grateful to UW for their general support and uh, liberal IP policy. Thank you very much for this. Okay, so any questions? Sorry, you can, you can you go ahead. You are, please continue the questions. You yeah. talked about generation security aspects. So does that also mean that the distribution problem is also solved, or each party must some other way communicate to each other what phases they're going to use? No, 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 that's a good question. Key distribution, this is from point A to point B. That's, you see, issues like identification, key distribution, I have been more thinking about this, more along the line of identification. That's another interesting point that if you could use somehow this random node for identification, that would be interesting. But you know, that has been, I have not had, not spent too much time. Any other questions? So I was, uh, yes, sir. It's a clarification in terms of uh, existing legacy wireless equipment. There's quite a few, quite a bit around it. How would it need to change? You need to change the transmit and receive chains on the yeah, that's a very good question. In terms of what we need to change, you see, it depends on where you want to go, how far you want to go. It's essentially can be just change, can be done at the access point. Um, you know, I talk to you and listen to somebody else. That solves some of the problems. But uh, in terms of having it at both sides, don't forget, this doesn't change the hardware too much. It's the same OFDM hardware. It's just another stage of equalization. And if you have, let's say, a MIMO system, many, many systems that are, you're right now in use, they have, say, four antennas for transmit, but in a lot of situations, they don't have, they are not in a situation to use all four antennas. So you can use two of those antennas to create a null at the receiver one. You know, it, it, it changes in the hardware. It's not that they have to go and change the entire hardware. It's a very minor change in hardware, but it has to be, you know, it has to go into actual, uh, FEGA or circuit. In terms of the MAC layer, if you want to do it right, essentially uh, this concept of superimposed uses the legacy system for that higher layer based on carrier sense, and the lower layer ha needs its own, you know, different, totally different resource allocation, MAC, and so on. But it will not be very, you know, different because we have two way communication in a lot of. Other standards, like, you know, my understanding is that in wired system, a lot of such scenarios they use to win. Oh, yes, sir. In, uh, in the traditional systems, we know that the transmission rate for, for the source, uh, at the source node. Uh, in the case of the media based, uh, you, you talked about changing the mu and sigma and epsilon. So what is the limitation of how fast you change those properties? Oh, the, and there is essentially zero limitation, no limit, very fast you can do it. You know, for example, one way we are doing this is that we are shining laser on a piece of silicon in the lab, and that's essentially immediate. But the question is, that is very fast, because all what you need is that the media absorbs the energy, and that can be done very fast. But the problem is, uh, you know, the question remains, when, we, when I am in an environment, how many different channel configuration I can get? In my opinion, it can get many, because we don't care about magnitude. All what we want is to change the phase for each receiver antenna. And if this breaks down, saying that you cannot put 20 antennas there, fine, you know, this has at least, the, it relies and assumes rich scattering environment, and MIMO system assumes the same thing. 
and assume it at two sites. So if there is a problem with rich scattering that some system fails, this has that problem only on one side, you know, not on both sides. But this, these are, I mean, this, this has not been tested. Media based, you know, we have done things in terms of changing channel, see what the phase changes, how, how it changes. You know, starting from, uh, maybe interesting, interest you, uh, fan with metallic blades, so you put it behind your antenna and you see that the phase is changing it, you know, because as this rotates. And then coming now to silicon and laser and things like this. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.